this is all very new to me. I just wanted to share with my readers what's going on here. And this paper is called uh, The Organized Opposition to Plate Tectonics, The New Concepts in Global Tectonics Group by David Pratt. This was first published in the Journal of Scientific Exploration, Volume 20, Number 1, page 97 to 104, uh, spring of 2006. So the previous paper that I wrote down, or that I recorded, was in 2000. This is six years after the fact. I went to this website, and apparently there's still this journal being published four times a year. And the, la the latest one was in June of 2016, so that's this year. They're still doing it, still going on. I suggest people looked at stuff up. I'll go ahead and link it to the bottom of this. But I want to read this out to you guys for some background on what's going on here. The new concepts, or it says here, NCGT Group, which is New Concepts and Global Tectonics Group. NCGT Group Origins and Activities. The new concepts and Global Tectonics Group is an informal association of Earth scientists who are critical of plate tectonics and want to explore alternative theories. It arose after a symposium on, quote, alternative theories to plate tectonics, end quote, held at the 30th International Geological Congress, IGC, in Beijing in August of 1996. The name New Concepts in Global Tectonics was taken from an earlier symposium held in association with the 28th IGC in Washington, D.C. in 1989. So this was going on when I was a little five-year-old running around catching lizards. The first issue of the New Concepts in Global Tectonics newsletter appeared in December 1996. And I'll go ahead and read this out to you guys. Although enormous strides have been made in our knowledge of the Earth, and much has been added to geology by physics and chemistry, we need to acknowledge that we are only at the beginning of of tabulating and understanding what is at the surface of the earth, let alone what is underneath. In this context, in the 1950s and 60s, the new theory of plate tectonics was propounded by geophysicists, physicists basically, and mainly young geologists with little experience, depth of understanding, or respect for the existing geology. The theory, although admittedly simplistic and with little factual basis, but claiming to be all-embracing, was pursued by its proponents in an aggressive, intolerant, dogmatic, and sometimes unfortunately an unscrupulous fashion. Most geologists with knowledge based locally or regionally were not confident in dealing with a new global theory which swept the world and was attractive in giving geology a prestige not equaled since the 19th century. I wrote a little star here. Basically, they wanted prestige. They wanted their, they wanted their uh, theory of everything, like one of my listeners uh, wrote down. They wanted there to be a, a single idea that they could base everything on and make things a lot simpler and make it to where if you were saying, oh, I'm a geologist, you could be at the level of a mathematician or somebody studying thermodynamics. They just didn't want geology to be the this boring thing where people who like rocks and minerals go to. They wanted to be considered important. They wanted a feeling of importance like that Dale Carnegie book says. It says here, it goes over some of the new, new newsletter stuff here. Um, go ahead and read the, finish this off real quick. The ideological influence and strength of the plate tectonic theory has swept aside much well-based data as though it never existed, inhibited many fields of investigation, and resulted in the suppression or manipulation of data which does not fit the theory. In the course of time, the method has become narrow, monotonous, and dull. A catechism repeated too often. I can't pronounce that word. Cat is spelled C A T. E C H I S M repeated too often. As new data has arisen, there is a growing skepticism about the theory. And it says here, although the newsletter was originally intended to appear twice a year, the enthusiastic response has enabled it to appear four times a year, averaging about 28 pages per issue. And the second issue, the editors wrote, from the response we have had, there is a considerable demand for publication. And the editors are aware 
from their own experience how difficult it can be to obtain publication, irrespective of their quality, for papers whose interpretations do not fit current orthodoxy, or, for example, do not excise data which might be construed by editors or referees as a challenge to orthodox theory on the basis that if the data does not fit the theory, it must be wrong. There's the peer review process again, uh, making sure that nothing disagrees with the paradigm. Go ahead and excise all that stuff before we can see the light of day, even though it's good data, which is basically not science. It's, uh, it's dogmatism. And there's a lot of dogmatism. Anybody who posts in a science form with a new idea will see that they'll have people running out of the woodwork coming in to call them a crank or a pseudoscientist or a crackpot and whatnot. Or that they're working on the fringe. Whatever. On page three, go ahead and read this out to you. Newsletter, diversity and debate. The NCGT group and newsletter represent a wide range of views. I read some of the newsletter. It's very wide-ranging. While some contributors to the newsletter are only mildly critical of plate tectonics, many entirely reject its key tenets of seafloor spreading, subduction, and continental drift, while Earth expansionists, people who believe the Earth was smaller in the past, accept seafloor spreading but reject drift, and most, though not all, reject subduction. So everybody can't be classified into you're either a plate tectonics person or you're not. There are a lot of gray areas involved, and I mentioned that earlier. Geological and geophysical data are generally open to interpretation and can often be explained in different ways. The newsletter's editors have highlighted the key importance of field geology. And this is very important here. We believe that workers in the geological sciences have to set themselves consciously to develop the, the broadest possible knowledge of the actual physical geology of the earth and its time relationships, meaning deep time, how long this stuff has been going on. There is elitism from physics and mathematics, but in the end, the place where theory must be tested, the actual experimental laboratory for testing theory in the earth sciences is the real earth. Now, there's a caveat to that based off the theory I'm developing, stellar metamorphosis. You can actually test the theory, reverse engineer the Earth to find out what it would have looked like in the past in real time, such as Jupiter, Saturn, Neptune, Uranus, and what it will look like in its future, Venus, Mars, Mercury, and what the Earth looked like even way, way, way early into its very beginnings, the very stars you see in the night sky. And that's for another talk. The editor sent submitted manuscripts to one or two reviewers among the group's readers before deciding whether to accept them. The basic aim is to allow both formal and informal contributions in a spirit of free and open communication and to publicize a wide variety of opinions. We'll see about that because I will write up a quick paper expressing the idea of stellar metamorphosis to these people and see what happens and I will give you feedback on it. Provided they are backed up with data. In the course of time, the editors have become more selective with regard to the articles they publish. So what's happening here is they're becoming more closed-minded. That's very dangerous. We'll, we'll see what happens anyways. And on the bottom, or towards the middle of this page, this stuck out to me because this is what I think is going on here. Some workers contend that the Earth as a whole is contracting slightly rather than expanding, but that there is evidence of phases of slight expansion in the past. They also propose that continental, oceanic, and back arc rifts can be readily explained in terms of tensional relief in a compressional stress field. So basically, if everything... Well, what happened was, when the Earth was a large uh, ocean-type world, it was very, 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 very big. Then the atmosphere was very, very thick, like Jupiter and all the way up to the Sun. But there reached a point where the atmosphere was more like Neptune and Uranus, and when that atmosphere starts dissipating away, the central core region will expand slightly because of the relief of pressure. And as the atmosphere disappears away and the, and the ocean starts dissipating, it'll, it'll collapse again and start shrinking a little bit because the pressure's been released and they can release all that internal heat a little bit more. So it will then contract a little bit more, and that's what's happening right now. So, yeah. 
There's there's tensional relief and compression. It's all over the earth in various uh, uh, magnitudes. And here's a good here's a good statement right below that. The classical plate tectonic model of thin, rigid lithospheric plates moving over a relatively plastic, low-velocity athenosphere is now known to be flawed. That's very, very, very important right there. And basically, or I'll go ahead and read this whole paragraph to you guys. In trying to show how the present continents used to fit together neatly to form supercontinents, drifters, con uh, plate tectonics people, have taken many liberties, and all reconstructions have problems. They fit the continents along different depth contours, ignore serious overlaps in geological dissimilarities, include or exclude ocean plateaus and ridges on an ad hoc basis, and entirely ignore the existence of former land masses in the present oceans. They don't even consider land masses in the oceans. Who cares about those? Earth and expansionists, too, place great emphasis on continental reconstructions and argue, that, and argue that all the present continents fit together much better on a smaller Earth, which is essentially the same thing that Plague Tithonics people are arguing. Further investigation of the ocean crust will provide a definite answer, definitive answer as to whether continental resembles, resem, reassembles based on plate tectonics or expansion tectonics are genuine, are genuine possibilities or illusions. I, I personally believe that they're illusions. But uh, more on that later. I'll go ahead and stop this video and uh yeah it's that's basically it the conclusion here uh doesn't really need to be read but i'll link this stuff to the bottom if you guys want to read it yourself go ahead there's a lot to it and it's not a question of oh this person's right this person's wrong what it's more is this person has a lot of good ideas and this person has a lot of good ideas and this person both have very bad ideas the trick is trying to find out where all those ideas fit together and what you do is look at the earth look what it's actually doing and converse and talk about this stuff and get it all out there simply ignoring it like the plate tectonics, plate tectonics people do because they have degrees is not how science progresses that's how dogma that's how dogma entrenches itself through many generations the kids go up into the graduate school they get taught by the people before them they teach the same stuff to their kids to graduate school, and it's, it's a never-ending process. The only way to, to upset that, that dogmatic uh, domino effect, if you will, is to challenge it. And I think that's what these people are doing, and good on them. I, I have a lot to learn from these people. Hopefully, uh, my listeners can learn from them as well. Today is September 13th, 2016.